Hello. Um, my name is Moxie Marlinspike. I'm from the Institute for Disruptive Studies, and I'm going to talk a little bit about privacy today. Uh, my hope is to combine sort of a general talk about trends uh, and uh, higher level themes with some specific sort of more technical projects that I'm working on and that other people are working on. And so what I want to do <clears throat> is start by uh, looking into the past, talking about uh, the threats that people saw, the projects that we thought were important, uh, the things that we were working on, and then talk a little bit about how I think that things are changing, and uh, then look into the future, things that I'm interested moving forward, trends that might continue, uh, things that could be important uh, in the future. So looking into the past, a lot of the technology narrative in the 1990s was uh, dominated by this thing, uh, the web browser. Uh, when Netscape first introduced Netscape Navigator, it was almost revolutionary, and a lot of people moved to capitalize on that knowledge. Uh, specifically, one of the major stakeholders that wanted to protect their interests was Microsoft. And when they introduced Internet Explorer, uh, the narrative sort of shifted from the web browser to this war. Uh, between browsers, the browser wars. And we, we all know how that turned out. At the same time, there was another war that was happening. And it was much more subtle, but perhaps more important. And it was a war over this thing, uh, the little lock icon, <clears throat> and more importantly, the uh, technology behind it. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, on one side of this battle uh, were the cypherpunks. These were people who were interested in spreading this information widely. Uh, they wanted to share this information, cryptography, uh, with everyone. And on the other side of this battle were the eavesdroppers. These were people that were interested in preventing the spread of this technology, preventing uh, the spread of these ideas. And so the lines were drawn. And on the cypherpunk side, you had people like Matt Blaze, Philip Zimmerman, Ian Goldberg, David Shaw, and Timothy May, the heroes of my teenage years. And the eavesdroppers thought these people were dangerous. In fact, their ideas scared the fuck out of them. <laughs> what they were talking about was a world where they were going to shift from having ultimate control and ultimate access to all information and all communication to a world where they would have no control and no access to information and communication. They thought that this was so, idea that, uh, so dangerous that they considered these ideas to be weapons, that uh, they were classified as munitions. If you uh, wrote a little bit of crypto code and you sent it to your friend in Canada, that was tantamount to exporting Stinger missiles. And you could be tried and prosecuted for that crime. At the same time, the government realized that um, this sort of narrative uh, might resonate with some people, that this concept of privacy could seem important. And so they had their own solution. Um, it was key escrow, which was best embodied by the clipper chip. And the idea was that they were going to embed this closed chip into every piece of consumer communications elect uh, electronics, every piece of uh, equipment, every telephone, every fax machine, every personal computer, it was going to have one of these little things in it. And you could use it to uh, establish secure communication with another party. The only trick is that uh, the eavesdroppers have sort of like a master key that they can use to uh, decrypt anything at any time. So their main problem was that cryptography is not a banana. That is to say that information is not an object. That uh, if you have a banana and you share it with your friend, uh, there is one banana in the world. If that friend then shares the banana with someone else, there is still only one banana in the world. Uh, information doesn't work like that. Every time you share information, you're making a copy, and there is a chance for an exponential explosion in growth. Uh, this sort of natural uh, recipe was made worse by the cypherpunks mantra, cypherpunks write code. Uh, their idea was that, you know, plenty of good research had been done in academia, uh, outside of government sectors for developing cryptography, but it was all mostly theoretical, it was all in papers, and that what they really wanted was software that actual people could download and use to communicate securely. And so they kind of went nuts. Uh, some people moved to Anguilla which is a Caribbean island that had very favorable laws uh, in this light where you could write crypto code and export it throughout the world without many problems. Other people came up with other, other strategies. Uh, Philip Zimmerman in 1995 published a book called PGP Source Code and Internals. And uh, 
all the book was, was the PGP source code printed in a machine readable font. Uh, and a very small print run. And the idea is that uh, if you have a digital representation of uh, some cryptographic cipher and you share it with your friend in Canada, that's exporting Stinger missiles. But if you print it into a book, then that is speech. So you print these books and you mail them all over the world and then those people scan it back in. Uh, which is easy because it's a machine readable font and now you've legally distributed PGP uh, very widely. So these strategies continued uh, and others like them and were, were very successful. Uh, and uh, you know, this war was sort of escalated further and further until 2000 when the Clinton administration suddenly repealed all of the significant laws uh, regulating the export and use of cryptography. And it sort of seemed like the war was won that you know, they had done it. And if you go back and you look at the original predictions that the cypherpunks made, uh, their sort of primary prediction was the most prescient, right? This idea that from the beginning, they claimed that the spread of cryptography is inevitable, that it is unstoppable and you, and you can try, but you will fail. And this was one of the first times that we really saw uh, that this idea that information really does want to be free. But if you look at their other predictions about what would happen once cryptography had spread and had become ubiquitous, they're somewhat less prescient. Um, they were things like anonymous digital cash will, uh, cash will flourish, uh, intellectual property will disappear, surveillance will become impossible, governments will, will be unable to con continue to collecting taxes, and as a result, governments will fall. If you flash forward 10 years from when these predictions were made, cryptography is the thing that allows you to securely transmit your credit card number to Amazon.com so that you can buy a copy of Sarah Palin's book, On Going Rogue. Um, you know, everyone's mother has an illegal copy of an MP3 somewhere, and cryptography is ubiquitous. There are actual dark nets that make the eradication of information impossible, but surveillance is at an all-time high, and privacy is probably at an all-time low. So what happened? We fought this battle, we won this war, and yet we're in this weird situation today that isn't what we thought we were going to get. So I guess my thesis is that I think that in many ways the cypherpunks were preparing for a future. And the future that they imagined that they were going to get was fascism. But what we got was more like social democracy. And that's not better, it's just different. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. How many people here would be okay with a law that uh, required everyone to carry a government mandated tracking device with them at all times? Probably nobody, yeah, nobody, right? Now, let me ask a different question. How many people here have cell phones? Everybody. So what is the difference? between a government mandated tracking device and a cell phone. A cell phone is just a tracking device that reports your real time position to using an insecure protocol to a few telecoms that are required by law to turn that information over to the government. So what is the difference between a government mandated tracking device and a cell phone? Choice. But you don't. <laughs> But you don't, do you? <laughs> right. Choice, I think, is, is the difference, right? That you choose to carry a cell phone, whereas you would be forced to carry this government mandating tracking device. Now, I have a cell phone. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would have a cell phone. Why would I want one? It's a government, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a tracking device. Uh, it operates over an insecure protocol. Uh, it, you know, it's a mobile bug. It's, uh, you know, all of these things. Why would I want one of these things? Well, I think if you look at the way that people tend to organize themselves in groups and communities to uh, collaborate, share information, that a lot of times there's sort of like informal networks that allow people to exchange information and collaborate. And there's this uh, well-known problem, right, where if you introduce a, something like a GSM cellular network to this community and you start using it, 
uh, you suffer from what's called the no network effect, right? Where the value of this uh, GSM network is in the number of people that are using it. And if you're the only person using it, then it's not very valuable. If, on the other hand, I somehow manage to convince everyone to start using this thing, it actually becomes very valuable and very useful to everyone involved. But there's actually like a subtle side effect, right? Which is that the old informal mechanisms that people use to collaborate and to communicate are destroyed. That technology actually changes the fabric of society. And you can see this in many small ways, just with things like cell phones, for instance, right? Like it changes uh, the way that people collaborate and communicate. Um, people used to make plans, right? You would say, I'll meet you at this street corner at this time, and we're going to go do this thing. And now people say, I'll call you when I get off work. And that's actually a major shift, right? That if you don't have the means with which to collaborate in that mechanism, then you can't participate in the way that people make plans, you know? And so there's actually this interesting thing where there's an inverse problem now, where if I decide that I don't want to participate in this cellular network and I leave, I once again am suffering from the no network effect. Because the old informal mechanisms that people used to use to collaborate and to communicate have been destroyed and, and are gone. So I'm once again a part of a network with nobody else. So yes, I chose to have a cell phone. But what kind of choice was it? And I think that this is the way that things are, are heading now, right? Where you start with something that's a very simple choice, a choice of whether or not to have some particular piece of consumer electronics, a mobile phone. And then over time, there's a push to expand the scope of the choice that you have to make, right? where instead of just the choice between having a mobile phone, eventually it becomes a choice of whether or not you want to participate in society. And that, that is beginning to be what we're seeing, right? Where instead of just having a mobile phone or not, it's a question of whether or not I can even participate in society at all. That to choose not to have a mobile phone is in some ways making that choice. And I don't think that that's necessarily a real choice or maybe not one that we would have to make, or we should have to make. So I think if you start looking at this trend of small choices becoming big choices, you begin to see it everywhere. Um, one of my most favorite recent examples is with the um, Firefox add-on, Adblock Plus. Are people familiar with this add-on? It's very, yeah, very popular, right? And so the idea is that uh, it's supposed to try and uh, block ads that you would see on the internet. And the way it works is uh, allowing you to specify a list of regular expressions that uh, should match uh, uh, likely ad URLs. And um, this is effective, but the problem is that these regular expressions always sort of need to be changing, right? That uh, new ad networks are introduced, people migrate to different domains, and so you, you need to sort of constantly be updating these things. And so what the Adblock Plus people have done is introduced a, a, a subscriptions model, where what you can do is subscribe to a list of regular expressions that is maintained by someone else, and then as those regular expressions are updated by this maintainer who's sort of on the ball, uh, you are getting the real-time changes. And uh, so there are you know, several po uh, very popular lists. And um, uh, it's expanded now to include not just uh, ad blocking, but also trackers. So there's a list uh, that I was subscribed to to block uh, trackers. These are things that are like web bugs that are going to track your movements around the internet. And one of the trackers that I'm most interested in blocking is uh, Google Analytics, right? Because uh, you know, what is creepier than Google than uh, this particular service? And, uh, so this list that I've subscribed to blocked Google Analytics along with a number of other trackers. And then one day, Google Analytics disappeared from the subscription, that it was no longer being blocked. And if you imagine sort of like the old world, right, you can think of the scenario where there's some Google executive who has found the maintainer of this list and, uh, you know, got a briefcase with a bunch of cash in it, and you know there was some shady backroom deal where they shook hands and exchanged the money, and that uh, this maintainer removed Google, Google Analytics from the, uh, the list. But in reality, that's, as far as I can tell, not what happened. Um, so what actually happened is that Google, um, Google Analytics works using JavaScript. That uh, to use Google Analytics, you just include a little bit of JavaScript into your page that you would like to maintain statistics for, and those statistics are automatically generated by the JavaScript that you include. And what Google started to do was include generic JavaScript functions in the JavaScript files that it provides for Google Analytics. So what they say is, well, you know, as long as you're including this JavaScript file to maintain the Google Analytics stuff for your website, 
we're just going to include some generic functions that you would probably want to use just for the base functionality of your website. And we're going to do this just to be helpful, and we're going to get it right, and it's going to be, you know, support all the browsers just, just so. And so now you can start to use these things in addition to the normal Google Analytics stuff. And so what they've done is expand the scope of the choice that you have to make. Because now, if you block the Google Analytics JavaScript from loading, you're not just breaking the statistics collection, you're breaking the functionality of the website itself. Because now, those generic functions that the website is depending on for its core functionality are no longer there, and the website stops working. So this is a brilliant move on Google's part, right? Where, once again, they've expanded the scope of the choice you have to make from just whether or not you want to uh, participate in the statistics collection to whether or not you can use the website at all. And once the, the, the scope starts to expand, it becomes harder and harder to make the choice not to participate in the statistics collection because you want to use these websites. So why is all this significant for us, right? Well, this man's name is John Poindexter. He is incidentally uh, the person who was found to be most responsible for a lot of the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, he was convicted of lying to Congress, but of course never went to jail, is pardoned or something. And in 2002, he introduced a government program called Total Information Awareness. What he wanted to do was, uh, uh, he made this speech when he introduced this program, and he says, uh, data must be made available in large-scale repositories with enhanced semantic content for easy analysis. Basically, what he wanted to do is siphon off all email traffic, all web traffic, all credit card history, everyone's medical records, throw it into one big sink without worrying about analyzing it in real time. Just collect all the data. And then once you have it and continue to accumulate it, you develop algorithms that will very efficiently mine that data to pull out profiles, statistics, relationships, whatever it is that you want at any given time. And so this was the totalitarian future, right? This was the cypherpunk nightmare that they had predicted all along. This is what they had been preparing for. And when this was announced, people freaked out, right? Well, why did they freak out? Well, on one hand, um, you know, because this is just so obviously the cypherpunk nightmare that people have been talking about for so long. But on the other hand, they just didn't really do it right. You know, these are people obviously from the old world. They don't understand how things work now. This was their actual logo for the government program. <laughs> This wasn't like The Onion came up with something to describe it. This is the logo that they chose. They have like the eye of God on the pyramid, conjuring all the Masonic shit with a light beam shining down on the planet, you know? That little bit of Latin means knowledge is power. I mean, they fuck this up, right? You know, like if, if you're gonna do something like this, if you're gonna have this crazy, scary government program, you need like a, like a friendly image. You, you know, just pick like a, like a teddy bear or something, you know, like call it the kitten surveillance society, you know? Don't call it total information awareness. I mean, really what you want is something that's um, kind of like colorful, something that's playful, almost cartoonish, that seems harmless, you know? Something like this. <laughs> Because these people did it right, you know. If you look at what Total Information Awareness was trying to do, and then you compare it to what Google is doing now, they're doing all of it. In fact, they're exceeding what Total Information Awareness was trying to do. You know, they've got all your email, all your web traffic. They've got your purchase records. They've got your medical records now. And if there's one thing that we know that Google has thrived on, it's the ability to take a large, insanely amount of information, insanely huge amount of information and very efficiently mine it to pull out the little profiles, the, the, the statistics that make sense. So obviously their intent is different, right? They're trying to sell advertising. You know, John Poindexter is trying to do something else. But make no mistake about it, they are in the surveillance business. That is what they do. It's a surveillance business. That is how they make money. And so the effect is the same. There's this quote, who knows more about the citizens in their own country, Kim Jong-il or Google? Google? Right, I think it's obviously Google. And, you know, the question once again is, why do we continue to use Google? Or, you know, why, don't we, why do we freak out about Kim Jong-il? You know, why, why is everyone scared of this person? And we're not scared of Google. And I think, again, it comes down to this question of choice. That there's, a, there's this... Um, I would say illusion of an option that is presented to you where you can choose to participate in Google services and Kim Jong-il is going to do his thing whether you want to or not. 
But again, I would say that the choice is expanding, that the scope of this choice is becoming larger and larger, and eventually it's going to encompass the choice of whether or not to participate in society. I mean, already, what would happen if you decided, I don't want to participate with Google, I'm never going to email anybody that uses Gmail? You would be cut out of the social narrative. You would be unable to correspond with people and function in society in general, I would say. So I would say that the trends have changed. That instead of this original cypherpunk vision, we've gotten something else, where technology starts by actually altering the fabric of society. And that information tends to accumulate in very distinct places as a result of those changes. And that then, the eavesdroppers just move to those points where information is accumulating. So the past was this very direct thing, where you know, governments, eavesdroppers, were trying to actually install surveillance equipment into every piece of consumer electronics, into every telephone, into every fax machine, every, into every computer. And the present is much more subtle. They figured out that that was not a winning strategy. Instead, they just moved to the few points where that information naturally accumulates. Places like room 641A at the AT&T WorldCom facility in San Francisco, where the NSA has been operating a fiber optic splitter for a long time now. The past was direct. You had things like total information awareness, where these scary government programs that were trying to very directly collect and, and accumulate all the information that they could. And the present is a lot more subtle. Instead of things like TIA, you have programs that start by soliciting rather than demanding your involvement. Things like Google, Facebook, Twitter. And so when I think about the future of like the things that I want to start thinking about more, the first thing that I want to do is acknowledge and deal with the choices that aren't really choices. That to recognize that maybe there isn't such a, a large difference between the cell phone in my pocket and the government mandated tracking device that I was so scared of so many years ago. And that once I recognize like how small that difference is, that I can start to see these things in different ways and react accordingly to come up with solutions that, see, that I think are important. So I think we have to acknowledge that these choices are expanding and that they are, in some ways, becoming demands. So, um, you know, having sort of made this acknowledgement in myself, I've started working on a few projects. Um, and, you know, the first thing I did is start thinking about Google. Um, you know, if I think of Google not as this thing that I'm just choosing to use, but it, in some ways something that is a part of society that I can't remove myself from, then I start thinking about, okay, well, what's, what is the problem, really? Well, the biggest problem is that they just have an awful lot of data, right? They record everything, you know? Uh, they, not just your search requests, not just your IP address, they record your TCP headers. They never throw anything away. Um, they know the contents of every email you've ever sent or received. They know the news you read, the places you go. Now they're collecting GPS location uh, and your DNS lookups, right? So they know who your friends are, they know where you live, they know where you work. They know where you spend your free time. They know about your health, your love life, your political leanings. Um, the thing is that they know not just a lot about what you're doing, but also they have a lot of insight into what you're thinking. Um, and they've done really well at mitigating any criticism along these lines. Um, they're most effectively, what they've done is control this debate by controlling the terms. That people have started to talk a little bit about Google and privacy. And what they've done is said, uh, well, we anonymize your data after nine months. Well, so first of all, they wait nine months. That's a little bit weird. But then what they've done is they've defined, they, they control the word anonymity. What they mean by anonymity is drop the last octet of your IP address. To me, that is not anonymizing, you know? But since they are able to control this word, now, uh, you know, it's, oh, okay, well, they anonymize my data. Um, they have also done things like, say, uh, you know, we're putting the privacy, your privacy under your control by introducing these things like the uh, Google privacy panel and stuff like that. Um, and this is also an interesting move on their part where what they've been able to do is um, display this information, but what they do is only display the information that is most obviously connected to you. They don't show you any of the things that they could very easily correlate to you 
And most important, importantly, what they do is require that to participate in their privacy settings, you have to have an account with Google, maintain a cookie, and be logged in at all times. So they've co-opted this thing where to care about privacy, you now have to participate in their tracking even more effectively, um, which is kind of a brilliant move on their part. They've slipped up a little bit um, recently. Eric Schmidt said this thing, if there's something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place, which is, I think, one of the first big mistakes that they've made. They have an excellent PR department, and uh, they just let this one slip. The other thing is that if there's one thing we've learned from the Aurora attacks is that they were likely about intercept, right? We've learned that uh, from the Aurora attacks that Google is likely running uh, real-time uh, lawful intercept systems uh, on their networks, and that not only do legal eavesdroppers or eavesdroppers with a legal backing have access to these things, but that they're becoming more and more appealing to eavesdroppers without a legal backing. Uh, and that we also know from these attacks that people who were interested in these systems were able to successfully compromise them and access the same information that law enforcement um, is monitoring every day. So, you know, thinking about these problems, um, I started this project called Google Sharing. And basically, the, the premise of Google Sharing is that we want to uh, reduce the scope of the choice that we have to make uh, when participating in Google services. And so, uh, reducing that scope to me means rejecting this sort of false choice of, well, you can choose or choose not to participate in these things. And so um, what I want is anonymous access to Google that is uh, fast and reliable. And uh, so the Google sharing system aims to uh, provide that. Uh, it's two parts, a Firefox add-on and a custom proxy server. And the way it works is that the add-on sits in your web browser and it watches all of your requests. And your requests just go to the internet uh, directly, totally unmolested, except for requests that would be destined to Google services which don't require a login. So th these are things like Google Search, Google News, Google Images, Google Groups, uh, Google Shopping, but not things like Google Checkout or Google Mail. And um, so those requests are siphoned off and sent to the Google Sharing Proxy instead of going directly to the Internet. And the Google Sharing Proxy maintains a pool of identities. Uh, each identity is basically uh, represented by a cookie that has been issued by Google, as well as some unique HTTP header information. So these are the things that are sort of like the fingerprint for your web browser, right? Like, um, you know, a specific user agent string or a specific set of content encodings. Uh, and it maintains this pool. And as requests come in, they are assigned to arbitrary identities. The information from the requests, uh, the HTTP headers in the requests is stripped off and the information from the identities is put on in their place and forwarded on to Google. Then the responses are forwarded or re returned to the Google Sharing Proxy, and uh, those are forwarded back on to the client. Um, so, and then we tried to take it a, a, a sort of a step up by um, encrypting the link between the client and the Google Sharing Proxy. So for things uh, like Google services where you wouldn't ordinarily get SSL protection, like you, you can't use SSL with Google search or Google images and stuff like that, that you do when you're using Google sharing because we uh, use SSL between this link on the, the client and the proxy. So this was sort of an interesting thing for me because when I went to like deploy uh, the Google sharing proxy, I was like, well, I need an SSL certificate. And uh, I've been like publishing uh, attacks on SSL for a little while, but it had been some time since I'd actually just gotten a certificate, you know. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, straight to the bottom, uh, you know, six dollar certificates. And uh, so I went to the website, you know, typed in my name. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where you have to create an account before you can actually get the certificates. So I go to create the account and I click the button, create account, and it signs me into someone else's account like someone in Turkey or something, I could see all their certificates and stuff. And I was like, man, this is like annoying. You know, it's like, I'm not even looking for security vulnerabilities. <laughs> I just want a certificate, you know? <laughs> and, it, and, you know, I'm, all right, well, you know, I'll log out, you know, and I'll try it again, you know, create account, and it logs me into someone else's account. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I could just keep doing this until I find something interesting, but actually I don't even care. I just want a real certificate, you know? like. I was like, well, I could issue one from this other guy's account, but you know, then it might get revoked or whatever, you know. 
Uh, and so, you know, I was like, all right, maybe, you know, the very bottom was not the best thing. I'll go one step up, you know, the $10 certificates or something like that. So, you know, I go to this place and it's a two-part thing. You have to fill out your contact information and then on the next step you submit your certificate signing request. So I fill out the contact information, Moxie Marlin Spike, blah, 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 you know, next. And it just says, request denied. I was like, well, how's that possible? I haven't even given you my certificate signing request. How could you validate this, you know, without even seeing the CSR, right? And so, you know, I submit a support ticket and I tried another one in a, a different company and the exact same thing happened. And I escalate these support tickets up through the infrastructure. And finally, I'm talking to some support person on the phone and he's like, you know, kind of confused and he's like telling me stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're banned from our system. Uh, uh, we're not allowed to issue SSL certificates to you. Fucking hell, man, you know, like, um, so that was annoying, but um, I did eventually get a certificate, and then there was even more drama with that, but, um, the, I mean, th so the nice thing about the system, right, is that there are existing anonymity proxies, right? Uh, things like the Tor project provide very strong anonymity guarantees, but the problem is that they're quite slow. Um, you know, Tor gives you a lot, but it also requires a lot. And uh, it's really not feasible for just sort of day-to-day -day usage. You wouldn't proxy all of your Google search requests through Tor. Uh, that would be, you would have some productivity problems if you did that. Um, and so what Google sharing is designed to do is be um, lightning fast, that it should be imperceptible to the user and that you can literally just leave it on all the time. Um, you know, for things like, you know, high value search requests where you still want some strong promise of anonymity, you should continue to use Tor. Uh, but for your day-to-day -day thing where you're trying to prevent Google from building a profile of information on you, that's where Google sharing thrives. So how does it look? Well, it looks identical to just using the Google services normally. That you can use things like Google Maps, you can th use things like Google News. Any Google service happens totally transparently. The only difference is in the bottom right corner, there's just a little status thing saying that Google sharing is enabled and working. Um, and you know, if at any point you need to log into something like Gmail, if you're using that, then it will happen totally transparently. Google sharing just won't proxy that stuff and uh, you can go straight to Google. So this thing is available at googlesharing.net. Um, another project, uh, so okay, thinking about anonymizing your access to Google, um, it's sort of a straightforward problem, right? Because your, your intention isn't actually to share information with Google. When you're using Google, your intention isn't to like give them your information. You're actually just trying to make use of some services. And anonymizing things, um, other services that have privacy implications are sometimes more difficult because, uh, for instance, in the case of something like Facebook, your intention really is to be sharing information. Um, so one uh, project that I sort of like in this area is this thing called Face Cloak that was developed by this uh, professor at Waterloo, Urs Hengartner. And the way it works is it's, again, a Firefox add-on that runs in your browser. And um, it allows you to use Facebook totally normally, only what you can do is prefix any data that you're going to submit to Facebook with uh, two at symbols. And when you do that, it will transparently encrypt the data before submitting it to Facebook. And then the add-on makes it very easy to share your keys with people in your friends network, such that if they are also running the add-on, that will just be transparently decrypted on their end. So the user experience is, again, exactly the same. Everything looks total, totally normal. And you're sharing information with the people you want to share information to the selective people in your friends group. And what's important is that Facebook never gets the data. All Facebook ever sees is these encrypted blobs, and to everyone else it looks totally normal. And this project isn't really like production ready right now, it's sort of a proof of concept, but I like the direction that it's going, right? Of trying to, again, minimize the scope of the choice that you have to make from whether or not you can use Facebook at all, which I think is becoming an increasingly difficult choice uh, to decide not to use Facebook, that once again, you become cut out of a social narrative uh, that you can't participate in some form of a society in some way, uh, to allowing you to continue to use Facebook without actually giving all of your information to this company that is going to collect and mine it. Similar things can be said for stuff like Twitter. Um, you know, in some ways, Twitter is like a, a broadcast medium, but in other ways, it's a conversational medium. And to the extent that it's a conversational medium, you can apply the same tactics. Are there people here that don't tweet? Anybody? Well, all right, okay. So, right. You people are my heroes. I tweet now, and something dies inside of me every time I do. <laughs> but, but I also recognize that I don't feel like this is a choice that I can continue to make anymore, that I can't just continue to decide, well, I'm not going to participate in 
uh, mobile phones or I'm not going to participate in Google or Facebook or Twitter, that I'm realizing that it's not worth trying to, as an individual, make these choices, that instead what I need to do is respond by uh, contributing and working on these projects that try and limit the scope of the choice that we're making. So I think my second thesis here is that uh, the crypto war was largely about data freedom, right? That um, early on the problem was uh, people were trying to control information and uh, the other people on the side of this war were trying to get that information out. And so it was easy to extrapolate from that situation that there was going to be a future of data control. That, you know, in the midst of the crypto war, it looked like this is what things were going to be like forever. And so a lot of the sort of important privacy projects were born out of that reality. And they ended up being things like dark nets, data havens, hidden services. Does anybody actually use these things? What do you use them for? So you use them just to see what's going on, right? Right, so one person uh, uses these things as out of curiosity, it sounds like. Um, but for the most part, I don't use these things and it doesn't seem like anyone else does. And I think that's because it's not the future that we got. You know, that in that moment, in the crypto war, we extrapolated this vision again into the future, just like this uh, vision of this totalitarian future. And we got something else. We got this thing that's a little bit more subtle. And so at the same time, there's this sort of phenomenon lately where privacy advocates tend to uh, love the other. So people that are working on these privacy projects are borderline obsessed with Iranian dissidents or Chinese dissidents. And I don't think that it's because the people that are working on these projects have anything in common with these people in these places. And if you look carefully, they really don't. But just because these are places that are still speaking a language that they understand, that these are places that are still speaking the language of data control. And so that language makes sense with the projects that were born out of this old reality. But I think even these places that are still speaking that language are starting to realize that it's not the most effective thing, that places like Iran have launched a national email service, right? They realize that it's much more effective to be Google than to be doing what they're doing now. That it's much more effective to start by soliciting rather than demanding involvement. That you can start the service and say, we'll give you unlimited storage and free access and people will sign up in droves and that it is, that is a much more effective technique for collecting information. So I think even these places that are still speaking this old language of data control are starting to realize that there are better methods. Um, I would also say that the loss of the crypto war was less about the eavesdroppers giving up and more about them changing strategies. That, um, in particular, the strategy of key escrow didn't work out. And so now I think they're deploying this new strategy of key disclosure. And uh, this is manifested in things like RIPA uh, in the UK, which is a law that says, essentially, you know, we're not going to try and regulate the use of cryptography because that's a hard problem. We've tried it before and it failed. So instead, we're going to let anybody use cryptography. You can use whatever you want. But if at any point we want to see what it is that you've encrypted, we come to you when we ask for your key. And if you don't give it to us, we put you in jail. And so this is a problem of key disclosure, which is ultimately a problem of using secure protocols that don't have uh, forward security embedded in them as a part of them. So again, if I'm looking into the future, the first thing that I want to do is start dealing with the choices that aren't really, cho really choices. And then I want to worry a little bit less about data freedom, but I want to worry a lot more about forward security. Um, in 2004, Nikita Borisov, Ian Goldberg, and Eric Brewer, their advisor, published a paper called Off the Record Communication or Why Not to Use PGP. And they made a few very simple but um, profound observations. Um, people, I'm sure, are familiar with the PGP model, even if most people don't use PGP. Uh, but you know, the way it works is if I want to send an email to Bob, I get Bob's public key, and I encrypt the email with Bob's public key, and then I send it to Bob. If I want to send a second email to Bob, I do the exact same thing with the same public key. A third email, and so on. And the observation that these people made in the OTR paper is that if at any point in the future Bob's public key is compromised, that all previous correspondence is also compromised. That if I send an email now, 20 years later, someone could compromise the key that I used to encrypt it, and now that email is compromised, even if it's been 20 years. So 
the observation is one key compromise affects all previous correspondence. The other weird thing that they notice is that the secrecy of what I write is dependent on your security practices. Right? Like, I'm paranoid. You know, I have like insane security practices, but how do I know that that's the same for whoever I'm corresponding with? That really, I'd like the secrecy of what I write to somehow be a function of my own security practices as well. And the third thing that they noted is that with these protocols, like PGP, you get authenticity, but there's no deniability. Right? So authenticity means that you know, Bob knows that the message came from me, but there's no way for me to ever deny that I wrote the message. Um, so for instance, if I write this email, hey Bob, today I was thinking that Eve is a real jerk. If at any point in the future this email is compromised, there is no way for me to deny that I wrote it. It has my digital signature on it. It's undeniable. Undeniable. Uh, and so what these people are proposing instead is this OTR model, where instead of actually encrypting data with your uh, public key pair, instead you only use those keys to sign ephemeral key exchanges. Right? So I do an ephemeral key exchange with Bob. Each uh, you know, part of that ephemeral key exchange is signed with our public key pair. And so then you use this ephemeral session key to communicate. And they sort of take it up a notch as well by saying that um, you know, you're using uh, this session key, but every message that you exchange also includes uh, one half of a key exchange. So every time I send something, it includes one half of a key exchange. I get a response, it includes the other half of the key exchange. And so now the, the key that you're using continues to roll forward with each message that you exchange. So that there's never even one key that is used to encrypt all of your correspondence, that it's constantly moving forward. Uh, and so there's no one key to ever recover. Uh, the other thing that they did was, uh, so you have a message, and in the OTR model, you encrypt it with some session key. And then you authenticate it using a message authentication code. And the key for that is derived from the session key. So immediately, this gives you some semblance of de deniability, because in the past, you used digital signatures. They're undeniable because there's only one possible author. In the case of message authentication codes, there are two possible authors, because two people know the session key, thus two people know the uh, key for the message authentication code, which means that if Bob receives a message, Bob knows that if the Mac passes, that it was either constructed by me or him. And since Bob knows that he didn't send the message, he knows it came from me. But if at any point, Bob holds up the message and says, Moxie sent this to me, I can say, no, 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 Bob made that message. And there's no way to prove that it came from me or Bob. What's more, since the session keys are constantly rolling forward, that means the Mac keys are constantly rolling forward as well. And that means that as the Mac keys become obsolete, you can just broadcast them in the clear. And once you broadcast it in the clear, anyone can forge previous messages, which means that you have an even greater sense of deniability, where you could say, not only did Bob write this, but anyone could have written this. Any eavesdropper could have written this message. So with the OTR model, a previous key compromise, uh, a key compromise does not affect all your previous correspondence, and you get authenticity, but you also get deniability. Uh, and I think that this is something that's going to become more and more important in the future, that as we design and roll out more and more secure protocols, this is going to be very important, important features of those protocols because we are dealing with this change from key escrow to key disclosure. So uh, in that light, another project that I've started working on is this project called Whisper Systems. And what we're trying to do is bring forward secure protocols into mobile phones. And so this is combining both of these areas that I'm interested in uh, for future trends, right? Mobile phones this sort of false choice that we're presented with, as well as forward secure protocols, something that's gonna come more and more important as uh, key disclosure becomes more and more of an issue. And so the first app that we're working on uh, is uh, this uh, secure voice app. And what we've, you know, there are plenty of secure voice apps for uh, cell phones that have been deployed before. What we're trying to do is make something that is extremely easy to use, something that runs on smartphones, something that you don't need special hardware for, something that is free, something that is, uh, requires no setup. You just install the app and you're done. And so what we've done is uh, write this for Android. And uh, right now it looks exactly like the normal dialer. It integrates into the existing contact system. It is just as easy or easier to make a secure call as it would be to make a normal call. Um, the way it works is by using uh, voice over IP. And so there's this problem, right, where like voice over IP uh, tends to not work very well. Um, and uh, particularly in the mobile environment, it tends to be really bad. And uh, our observation is that most of the problems, the flakiness that people experience with uh, mobile VoIP uh, comes down to the signaling layer. 
that uh, if you have uh, a normal VoIP setup, you have uh, your clients who have to maintain a connection to some kind of uh, switch like Asterix. And they have to maintain that connection at all times that they want to send or receive calls. And the problem is that in the mobile environment in particular, uh, you have network connectivity issues. You tend to go you know, in and out of uh, network connectivity. Uh, these connections can break, and you might not even really know it, or one party might know it, but not the other party. Um, and uh, what's more, it requires that your phone be on all the time. You can't, like, your phone can never go to sleep because you have to maintain this TCP connection to some server. And so what we've done is realize that in the mobile environment, there's actually an existing uh, signaling infrastructure that we can avail ourselves of instead of falling back on this traditional thing. And it's called the telecom network. <laughs> Uh, that they have done a very good job of uh, setting up this signaling infrastructure that people use to exchange information on their phones. And so what we're trying to do is just leverage that for the signaling aspect of our VoIP app. And so as a first cut of this, what we do is uh, signaling via SMS. And it all happens behind the scenes. It's not like you get a thing in your inbox or whatever. Yeah. But um, that you know, do, signaling via SMS allows you to take out the central server altogether. No one has to run an asterisk box anyway. All the addressing is done by your normal phone number. Your phone can go to sleep, and uh, everything should work quite well. So you don't have to maintain this, constant, maintain this constant connection. You don't need the equivalent of a Skype ID, a Fring ID, or something. You have your phone number, and that's it. And you don't need to run a, a VoIP server. You just install the app, and now you're ready, ready to make or receive calls to anyone whose phone number you already know. Um, then, uh, to provide the security aspect of this, the RTP channel is actually a ZRTP channel. And uh, ZRTP is a protocol that was developed by uh, Philip Zimmerman. It's actually a very nice protocol. Uh, the way it works is that it does a, once again, ephemeral uh, session key. It negotiates an ephemeral session key. And uh, then that is used to uh, communicate between the two devices. And then uh, a short authentication string, string is Sorry. A short authentication string is derived from uh, that session key. So the way it works is that once a call is set up, at the bottom of your call screen, there will be two words. In this case, flatfoot Eskimo. And those two words are derived from the session key that both parties have. So what you do is you make the call, and the first thing you do is you look at the string, and then you say, flatfoot Eskimo. And the person you're talking to says, yep, flatfoot Eskimo. And now you know that you both have the same string at the bottom of your phones, which means that there was no man in the middle attack, which means that the entire like, authenticity problem of distributing keys, setting up some crazy PKI, web of trust, all of that stuff, you don't have to deal with any of that. All you do is read this string to each other when you first set up the call. Um, these strings are actually sometimes really prophetic, too. You know? Especially late at night, you'll be like, yeah, flatfoot Eskimo. That's what I'm feeling, man. <laughs> So uh, the other project that we're working on is um, an encrypted SMS app that is uh, derived from the OTR protocol, where, uh, once again, the app looks identical to the um, existing SMS client for Android. Uh, the only difference is that if you happen to be exchanging messages with someone who also supports this client, uh, it will negotiate these ephemeral session keys using the OTR model. And every time you exchange an SMS, once again, the key will roll forward. So there's never one key that you can compromise to uh, obtain all previous messages. So it looks like I'm about out of time, but um, these projects are sort of my small hope for reducing the uh, scope of the choice that we're beginning to be faced with more and more. And uh, you can find more information on my website, thoughtcrime.org. Thank you. Questions? The question is, uh, aren't you putting yourself at risk with Google sharing because um, you, someone else's activity could be traced to you and maybe they're doing something really bad? And the answer is, I, I don't think so because, um, like for instance, your cookies never leave your web browser. So your Google cookie 
never leaves the web browser. It is stripped off before it's submitted. The cookies that are being passed around are cookies that were issued freshly from Google and have no relationship to you. There's no way uh, that these cookies or these requests can ever be associated back to you um, as it is. So, another question. The question is, is the Whisper Systems Android app available now? And uh, it should be available, both apps should be available as a public beta in about a week. Right. Uh, the, the, so the question is, uh, if you're doing OTR over SMS, um, don't, can't you fit less characters in your SMS message? And uh, it reduces it your, by 60 characters. Uh, so we do elliptical curve cryptography, which is um, you know, very small keys, so that when you exchange it with you know, each message, it has minimal impact, but still, you lose 60 characters. Yeah. And another question. The question is, uh, have we con considered just using OTR as it is and fragmenting the message? Um, the first problem is that OTR as it is requires a five or six way handshake. Uh, so to start communicating with someone uh, via SMS, you would have to exchange messages five or six times, which seems, uh, has, I think, usability implications. And um, the other problem is that, uh, yeah, you could just uh, use like the straight up Dippy Hellman stuff, but uh, each, I think each message you exchanged would then become five messages and people tend to care about like SMS cost and stuff like that. And also ECC is the future. It's uh, all of the, uh, everything else has been removed from the NSA Suite B uh, recommendations. And so I, I think we should all be looking uh, for ECC in the future as well. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the question is, like, if you've been using Google for a long time, isn't it too late to care about all of this stuff? Don't they ever always already know everything about you? And I think the answer is probably yes and no. You know, that yes, they have a lot of information, and that's uh, troubling. But uh, you know, if you start now, then you know, eventually that information might become stale. For email? Yeah. So the, uh, the question is, with the OTR stuff, are we going to like uh, maybe move that into anonymous emailers and things like that? And uh, I think that's a great idea. I, I'm not working on it now. We've been talking a lot about trying to restart the tenant. Uh-huh. Because after it got shut down, so decided to all of you guys. Oh. Like trying to figure out this project. Cool to be able to use stuff like that and have anonymous emailers. Right. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a, it, I think a lot of people have been thinking about this probably, but the it seems like the anonymous remailer stuff probably needs to be rethought a little bit since like the original uh, developments. Uh, based, you know, we live in this spam-filled world, and there's uh, you know all these other considerations that have emerged. So, I would love to see that stuff take off again. But. Yes. Um, the question is, am I aware of um, any efforts to alert users to the privacy implications of using things like Google and Facebook? And I mean, I don't really know. I, haven't, I don't know of any um, like sort of codified programs, um, but there are definitely groups like you know, Epic, EFF, Privacy International, who are constantly uh, you know, blackening the skies with press releases about uh, what's going on in these places. Um, so that's good. Uh, all right, so I got it from Gandhi.net, which is like a registrar that is pretty cool. But, um, and I deployed it, and then they revoked it, like without warning me, no notice. I didn't even get an email when they revoked it. It just showed up in the CRL and on the OCSP provider. And they actually took down um, 
the service for uh, like five days because uh, you know no one could use it because instantly uh, everyone was getting the revocation notices in their browsers. And uh, based on the way that it was set up, there's no real easy way to click through it or to um, exempt the certificate. And uh, so I went through a bunch of stuff with them. There's a lot of drama. Uh, the Register wrote an extremely scathing article about Gandhi.net uh, that was pretty crazy. But um, in the end, uh, I, now I distribute a self-signed certificate with the uh, add-on. So what happens is the add-on comes with a self-signed certificate, and then that self-signed certificate is what's being used on the default proxy server. And uh, so it just does the compare. And it's actually more secure than uh, with a CA certificate because there's no opportunity for the CA to issue a rogue certificate. And uh, you know now it's not possible for some certification authority to take down the entire service in one move. Shoot. OK, sorry. Thank you.